If Pascal's pessimism can so effectively console us, it's because we are usually cast into gloom not so much by negativity as by hope. It's hope with regard to our careers, our love lives, our children, our politicians, our planet, that's primarily to blame for angering and then embittering us. The incompatibility between the size of our aspirations and the mean reality of our condition generates the violent disappointments which torture our days and etch themselves in lines of acrimony across our faces. We should honour Pascal and the long line of Christian pessimists to which he belongs for doing us the great favour of publicly and elegantly rehearsing the facts of our rather sinful and pitiful state. Reading Pascal reminds us that the secular are, at this moment in history, a great deal more optimistic than the religious, something of an irony given the frequency with which the latter have been derided by the former for their apparent naivety. It's the secular whose longing for perfection has grown so intense as to lead them to imagine that paradise might be realised on this earth after just a few more years of financial growth and medical research. With no evident awareness of the contradiction, they may in the same breath gruffly dismiss a belief in angels while sincerely trusting that the combined powers of the IMF, the medical research establishment, Silicon Valley and democratic politics will together cure the ills of mankind. Religions have wisely insisted that we are inherently flawed creatures, incapable of lasting happiness, beset by troubling desires, obsessed by status, vulnerable to appalling accidents, and always heading for death. Why should any of this be so cheering? Perhaps because pessimistic exaggeration is so comforting. Whatever our private disappointments, we can start to feel very fortunate when we compare our mood to Pascal's. Pascal wanted to turn us to God by telling us how awful life was. But by sharing his pessimistic analyses, he ironically strengthens us to face the trouble of our own lives on this earth with greater courage, forbearance, and occasional humour. So there he is. Depressing? I don't think so. You could take it that way, but remember, the point here is not to be morbid and sad. The point is to have a blessed despair, which is what we hopefully can arrive at with existentialism. Let me just turn this off here. say it's a little pointless just to like agonize and despair over every single thing that's wrong with the world, you know. It is, which is why it's it's, it's um, the question of what you do with that. That's a starting point. If you if you're stuck there, you're just a rebel without a cause, and and uh, stuck in your uh, fifteen year old dumb maybe. Uh, but maturing beyond that, Pascal, no, it's. The, the, even the video acknowledges that uh, Pascal's most famous teachings here, perhaps, are the first half of his book. Uh, but it wasn't really a book, by the way. It was his unpublished letters. If you try to read it, it'll be impossible because it's as if you had some uh, journal that you wrote down random thoughts in, and then you died one day, and somebody took your journal and published it. That would probably be a mess, right? I don't know if anybody keeps journals these days, but. Uh, that's what happened with Pascal. So I don't recommend trying to just pick up the Ponce, which is what this was referencing above all. Reading it, it won't, it'll be too difficult. It, it'll be too scattered and incoherent. But uh, for him, all of that darkness and cynicism was certainly just a just a starting point for what he hopefully after, which was inspiring people to have uh, eternal aspirations that are not so prone to uh, to weak to tragedy. Um, but anyway, still, e even, even if we leave that aside for a moment and focus simply on the existential uh, dread, if you will, that he espouses in the first part of the book, I think we can glean quite a bit from it. But let's take a look at the beginning portion of what you guys read already and put him in his context here. Uh, who has come in since I handed out the discussion sheet? No problem. Anybody else? Uh, I don't have my paper notes with me today, so I'm not up here clicking around on Facebook, that, by the way. I'm just looking at my lecture notes. I don't even have Facebook. 
All right, so why should we care about what Pascal says? Well, as I said before we looked at the video, this is one of those rare cases where it's not just some philosopher claiming that his thoughts are so profound that everybody should listen to him. It's someone who already really proved himself in other areas of life as uh, an extremely intelligent fellow really, uh, really onto some things. This remind anyone of anybody by any chance in my intro fill class, if anyone here recalls the beginning of the semester? I'll say it's Socrates. Even, even earlier. Hold on, what's on? <laughs> <laughs> the first pre Socratic? Aristotle. No, that's not Aristotle. That's all right. Thales. So, th uh, don't worry, I won't run out about Thales now. Thales is like the first, first, first philosopher. Socrates is really the father of philosophy, but Thales is even earlier, and he just figured out all this stuff about the world. He figured out the circumference of the world when most people thought it was flat, and figured out how to. Uh, how do um, he discover naturally occurring magnets? He, just, he calculated how many days were in a year before we had uh, an idea as to the precise number. So he comes on, he's also got these philosophical ideas that people would listen to naturally because he proved himself in realms where it is easier to see if one is proven. Philosophy also can and should prove itself if it's worthy. But it's harder to, it's not as obvious when you have a worthy philosophy. It's not as immediately obvious, I should say. Not as measurable, perhaps, would be the way to put it. It's very easy to see if someone has a, a valid engineering idea, because you can just look at what? And you can see if, if it produces the result of it. Yeah, if it. If it creates good products, he's probably onto something with his theory of design. So, you know, the scientific theories that actually work to predict what happens in the future can pretty easily demonstrate their authenticity that way. With philosophy, you know, it's, it can be harder to see, but fruits of good philosophy should be a good life. So, if, uh, if a philosophy produces that, there's a good chance it's a good philosophy. If it fails to produce that, it's not a good philosophy. But that's not as measurable, of course, as, as a new microchip that works or something like that. So with Pascal, we don't have to so much demand that he prove himself right off the bat because we already know him as a genius in, in other regards. So Pascal's triangle, Pascal's law. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't help it as an engineer here. But to just tell you about how awesome Pascal's law is. Does anyone happen to live in a house? Okay, some people, okay. Was it by any chance built after um, the 1700s? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so most of us live in a house that was built after the 1700s. Wow. You can thank Pascal for that. Because it had a foundation that was dug probably by a hydraulic power excavator. Okay, it was maybe those came in late in the 1800s, but still. The vast majority of us, no doubt. And right now, we're in a building that certainly has its foundations dug by a hydraulic how the heck are those things so powerful? Pascal. Very simple thing. That we, we might take it as simple today, but he discovered this. That when a certain pressure is applied to a fluid, that pressure is automatically and instantaneously uniformly spread throughout the continuous domain of that same fluid. So what that means in practice is if you have a, uh, a small diameter tube right here connected to the same vat that a larger diameter tube is connected to with hydraulic fluid in here, fluid of any sort, you can put some force down on this piston, and this piston will rise up with drastically more force, proportional to the difference in the uh, surface areas of the pistons. Simple thing that he discovered enables the whole uh, the whole domain of hydraulics, which we need for just about your cars also certainly need it. But anyway, so we, we are already in debt to Pascal for his discoveries in science and math. So I think we owe it to him to take his philosophy seriously. Doesn't, we don't owe anybody just blind agreement and everything, of course, but I think we owe it to him to take a look at his philosophical ponderings. He, he, he actually demonstrated this, I sure hope, that this is Pascal that had in mind, and I think it was. He demonstrated this concept in public with a, a barrel, a really strong oak barrel, and a straw. Has anyone heard of this before? 
the barrel and straw. So Pascal said, I can make this barrel explode with a straw. And he did. All I needed was a ladder. So he gets up on the ladder. That is a very well drawn ladder. And uh, he pokes this little tiny straw into this really big strong barrel. And he just fills up this little straw with a cup of water. And that caught, it was, it's very easy to do, but because of the height of this straw, it's so very narrow that it's easy to create quite a pressure at the bottom of the straw, which equally pressurizes everything in the barrel, and the barrel cannot handle that much pressure and explode in front of everyone. He thereby proved his theory. So, uh, he lived at about the same time as Descartes, among the most famous of the philosophers. He was younger than Descartes, uh, though, and he had sent Descartes some, I think, mathematical treatises of his, and Descartes couldn't believe that an adolescent had come up with what Pascal did in his teenage years. So he was quite a fellow, this Pascal. It's too bad he died early, 30s, late 30s, I think. Um, taking a look at your book here, the part you read, he places Pascal in the context and contrasts the context of Pascal to the context of another precursor to existentialism, which I didn't have you read about, but who was that again? I mean, he's mentioned in the beginning of the reading. Yeah. So, we didn't go through the chapter on him, but uh, because that did trans because that was talked about in the book before this, the author feels it needs to contrast the so-called world inhabited by Augustine from the world inhabited by Pascal. But I really took note of here what our author says that with Augustine, we were dealing with a precursor to existentialism. With Pascal, he says, we are dealing with an existentialist, which is, which is uh, not a claim that most would make, because most would say that existentialism began, strictly speaking, with uh, Kierkegaard, who was well after Pascal. But if you really look at what Pascal is saying, it's so thoroughly existentialist that it's hard to not just say, yeah, he's a full-blown existentialist. So the world that St. Augustine inhabited was the Neoplatonic cosmos, a luminous by the way, it's the same world, literally. We're talking about the kind of sense of the world in the cultures that they lived in. The, the, idea, the ideological approach that people took to understanding the cosmos is, is what the author is contrasting here. A luminous crystal palace with a super essential good fixed in its highest point, radiating outward like a beacon and diminishing in brilliance as it shone down through the rest of the perfect structure. That's I want to share some quotes from another book I brought with me in a moment. But that's the world that Augustine inhabited. This idea of the Platonic forms as, what are they again? Physical objects, physical. Yeah, they're like almost physical. They're like real things. But they exist in this realm of the forms. And that this whole world we're in is this kind of shadowy imitation of all of the corresponding ultimate realities that exist in perfection in this realm of the forms. We're striving after this realm of the forms through philosophy and intellectual action in general. But it's really there, literally, in the Neoplatonic mind and the Platonic mind. So, for St. Augustine, we can have this down in the first one there. It's the Neoplatonic world of the theory of forms. Pascal. Pascal comes in, uh, born in the, six, in the 1600s, I believe, if I recall correctly. Augustine was around the 300s, 400s. So Platonism itself was already quite old in St. Augustine's day. Was, I mean, we think of it all as just old. That's how we tend to just think of things before the 1900s oh, as just old. Augustine, being 700 years after Plato, 
That'd be like us looking back at something in the 1300s. Uh, Just like forms or forms? Forms. The theory of the Neoplatonic world of the theory of forms. So this was a major revival. It'd be like, imagine us really bringing back some concept that, that had its beginnings in the Middle Ages, the 1300s. Um, and yet it was still able to really flourish because the people in St. Augustine's time saw the wisdom in this newly rediscovered Platonic theory of things. And as always happens when you rediscover something, you make it better still. Wait, so who rediscovered it exactly? Saint well, St. Augustine was big in this. He wasn't the one who kind of reintroduced Plato. Plotinus would probably be most famous for reintroducing Plato into the uh, Roman world at that time period. And I think Plotinus was just a little before Augustine. I can't remember now exactly. But um, we, uh, I think we should be inspired by that, that we don't have to be so self-absorbed with our own modern... Uh, era that we can't have any revivals from some more ancient wisdom. Anyway, what, what, what about the, quote, world? Yes, same world, but what about the, the uh, idea of the world for Pascal? Well, Pascal's was the desolate and desiccated world of modern science. This is actually not intended to uh, be critical of science. It's, it's science is supposed to be honest about the very uh, dry appearance of it in contrast to this exalted, crystalline, uh, fantastical almost idea of reality before it. Where at night the sage hears not the music of the shining heavenly bodies, but only the soundless emptiness of space. The silence of these infinite spaces frightens me, Pascal said, voicing the reaction of the human heart to the universe that 17th century science had fabricated for man. In that world of frightful and empty space, man was homeless. So he is not, the author is not bringing that up in, the, in order to condemn that worldview. He's doing it in order to give the context for understanding Pascal's almost primal cry of despair at the sense of homelessness of modern man in the world as he understands it. So how can we put that quickly? Well, Pascal, the reductionistic is the word that I think fits best. I mean, the, our author says desiccated and desolate, and that's that's poetic. But what we're, what the philosophy behind that is, is reductionism. Redu reductionistic, quote, demythology. So, the two worlds contrasted here uh, are hard for us to even understand, maybe, the contrast. So, what I brought today is a book called The Philosophy of Tolkien. Anyone read The Lord of the Rings or watched the movies? Yeah, most of them. <laughs> Hopefully most of us have. It, it's... Uh, I love it. I think Lord of the Rings is great. But this, uh, this uh, by the way, this guy, Peter Crape, he is a philosopher. He is a philosophy professor, and I like to every now and then quote various works of his. This one, I think, is the perfect work to quote right now. And don't worry, I'm not going to test you on this, but I want to give you a little more background, because I think that Crape is onto something in saying that Tolkien, Tolkien was not a philosopher, of course, he was a philologist, I, I believe, a linguist of sorts, most well known for his novels, his fictional novels. But Kreeft argues that there is an implicit philosophy subtly permeating all of Tolkien's works, and that this philosophy is actually in its essence a rebellion against reductionism. 
the philosophy, the kind of post-Enlightenment rationalist philosophy, and that within Tolkien, Greek values again, is kind of a return to a sense of the Platonic view of the cosmos. So let's see how Kreef describes it here. What kind of a philosopher is, uh, is that professor? What's his, uh, well, he's, uh, he teaches at Boston College. I don't know what exactly his focus is. Probably history of philosophy, I'm guessing. I'm not sure. Um, I feel like every, every philosopher has to like, identify with the overall philosophy. Oh, well, he's, he's a Platonist. They don't, they don't have to. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, he definitely identifies as both a Platonist and an Aristotelian, which I would kind of myself. Uh, in other words, he, he operates within that tradition. He, um, many will find that paradoxical because there's obviously contrast between Plato and Aristotle. But Kreef sees them as much more reconcilable than many, and I agree with him. Yeah, I was going to say, why do you have to pick one? Why can't you be like a mixture? Oh, yeah, you and, and have just about everybody's a mixture. I mean, if you, uh, like if you look on any philosopher's Wikipedia page, for example, you'll probably see a bunch of names in the um, influenced by. Have you, has anyone ever noticed that you go to a, uh, the Wikipedia page for an intellectual scholar of any sort, and almost always there's an influenced by box. And that's really helpful to know what traditions, what intellectual traditions the, the, the scholars operating within. Because yes, that, that everybody has some degree of, of uh, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants to some degree. Some, of, some people are willing to acknowledge that and others are not. But, um, and then there's also the influenced box, which would be uh, rather empty for someone who's just entering into the fray. And grief being alive today, I don't know how many. I don't know if there's any actual philosophers yet who consider him to be the one giving the tradition they're operating within. But I think it might well come to be someday, because I think he has really profound insights. This philosopher Peter Kreeft. Anyway, um, I don't want to spend too long on this. I just have a page or two here with some insights that I think describe well the worldview that we've inherited from the post-Enlightenment rationalism, which is, in some senses, the worldview that existentialism rebels against. I'm not saying that Kreeft here is espousing existentialism. He's not. I'm just saying I think this particular insight is relevant to this contrast that we should try to understand. All right. The question he's addressing here is the question, how big is reality? I mean, it seems like a very strange question. How big is reality? Now, divide and if we're going to divide and conquer that question, there are three basic ways of answering it. Either reality is even more than our thoughts about it, or reality is even less than our thoughts about it, or reality is nothing. That'd be gorgeous. Equal to, yeah. So, he, he sees those as the three distinct categories that define where one fits in this question that we're, that we're addressing here. And here's how he explains it. Okay, the first is to say, along with Hamlet to Horatio, there are more things... You ever heard this quote? Any Shakespeare buffs here? I'm certainly not. <laughs> there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophies, Horatio. That was Shakespeare's philosophy. Uh, this is the philosophy of all pre-modern cultures. The thought that our own thoughts about reality are dwarfed by reality itself. In other words, there is room for mystery. There is room for mystery. If there is more to reality than your own philosophies about it. The second possible answer is that there are fewer things in reality than there are in our thoughts. Most of our thought is mere myth, error, convention, projection, fantasy, fallacy, folly, dream, etc. This is the philosophy of the unhappy man, the cynic, the pessimist. Trust nobody and nothing. This philosophy is hardly ever found in any pre-modern culture, except in a very small minority. The third possibility is that there are exactly the same number of things in reality as there are in our thoughts. So, what difference does it make to your life which philosophy you believe? Grief argues, it makes a total difference. It differs absolutely every single thing in your life. It colors everything. 
For if you believe the first philosophy, as Shakespeare did, as Tolkien did, and as most pre-modern peoples did, then your fundamental attitude toward all reality is wonder and humility. You are like a small child in a large house. Wonder, put that in mind. Anybody here? Huh? Discussion, she... Number one. Philosophy... Begins in wonder. Begins in wonder. This doesn't. This philosophy begins in arrogance. <laughs> it begins in okay. thinking you have it all figured out. And all you gotta do is like maybe get some more funding or something and you'll, and you'll cure all the problems in the world. But good philosophy begins in wonder. And you can't wonder if you don't presuppose that there's more out there than is already in your thoughts. Because then there's nothing to wonder about. You, your goal is to simply demythologize all of the wonder of those uh, who experience it. Okay. You expect mysteries. You expect moreness. Terrors to stop your heart and joys to break. Reality is big. Do you believe the second philosophy? There are fewer things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophies, and you are cynical, skeptical, suspicious, bored, jaded, detached, ironic, and definitely not heroic. You are a reductionist. You reduce mystery to puzzle, love to lust, thought to cybernetics, reasoning to rationalizing, ideals to desires, man to ape, God to myth. The third philosophy, however, is rationalism. This is, so where is Pas what world does Pascal inhabit, if you will? Somewhere between the second and the third. Somewhere between the reductionism and the rationalism. As Hegel said, who of my intro Phil students remembers? The real is the rational, and the rational is the real. And that's a big deal to assert that, because to say the real is the rational, and the rational is the real, well, it's one thing to say that the rational is the real. That's not controversial to say, yeah, if it's reasonable, it's real. Or at least can be. But to assert the biconditional, that is to say, to assert it both ways, is to assert a definition. So what Hegel is saying, as being a quintessential rationalist, is saying, there is nothing real that is not absolutely perfectly compartmentalizable within my rationalistic philosophical system that I've concocted. So he has no room for mystery, no room for anything that is extra logical, which is a whole discussion I have with my intro phil classes, how Socrates shows us that philosophy does not reject the extra logical. It only rejects the illogical. There are many things beyond mere logic. Um, that as long as they don't contradict it, should not be rejected outright. There's, a, there's a, a quote from Pascal on that. The heart hath reasons that the head knoweth not. I believe that's Pascal. So you can just know something. And this is an existential theme, I think. You can just know something and not know why you know. <clears throat> Because to know why you know something is to deliver intellectual reasons for that knowledge. But to simply know something sometimes can be deeper than even that. Can you give me a time? How about when you absolutely know there is something you must do because your conscience demands it? Sometimes you can't give a good philosophy, ethics-based explanation as to why you must do it. Has anyone ever known they just must do something? Are you talking about, like, intuition? Yeah, it's certainly a form of intuition. No, yeah. I was gonna say, like, yeah. Instinct. Instinct, yeah, instinct, uh, biological. Level, what you sure. need to do? Just, just do it. You, sometimes you know you've got to do something. Or, or on the converse, sometimes you know something you absolutely must not do. Instinct's not biological. Ooh, yeah, I love this. I mean, there's quite a, a dual that's... role between physiological and uh-huh, okay. So whatever it is, it seems to be kind of extra rational. And I would caution, because I, 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 I like being rational, that's, that's kind of my job, um, that we don't want to reject rationality. We really should make sure that we're not believing anything irrational. The point is there's more out there than just what we can figure out with our rationality. So we... the. Don't forget that what we're saying here is, is one thing to defer to the extra logical, but do not allow the illogical ever into your mind. So generally, when we refer to heart, 
We all, I'm sure, have heard of the head-heart distinction. And the point is, what those things you just know, feel, believe, whatever, that pertain to the heart, is not philosophy's job to simply reject them, just because it doesn't pertain to the head. It is a rationalist's job, or so he thinks. And that's what uh, Kreeft is trying to describe here. He continues, but I think that only those with a divinity complex can actually believe that. Meaning thing, those who think they got uh, Even pantheists who believe the whole cosmos is only a thought or a dream do believe that it is not our dream, but rather God's dream. And therefore it's still more, or transcendent, to our thought. Thomas Howard, and I don't know who that is, but he's quoting him here. Thomas Howard called good fantasy a flight. Let me ask you this. Try to guess what goes in this blank. It's one word. And he's saying good fantasy is a flight blank reality. Above. Above, okay. Flightless reality. Let's think flightless. Trumps. Any other thoughts? <coughs> it's, it's, it's paradoxical. It's intentionally ironic. What's the first thought? Because we're inclined to think that we <laughs> we'll play hangman. <laughs> we're inclined to think that what should go, if we're defining good fantasy, one might be inclined to suppose that the word that goes in there is from, right? Fantasy is delivering you from reality. But Thomas Howard is saying, oh, good fantasy is a flight to, to reality. I got on the same track. <laughs> <laughs> to reality. He's not saying, we're not, it doesn't mean we all revert to being children and pretend that fantasies are literally true. No, the point is, as he continues, although the details of good fantasy are fictional, the nature of its world, its universal principles, and its values are true. And that's what actually matters about a story. Tolkien shows us the nature of the real world, to, sorry, Tolkien shows us the nature of the real world by his fantasy. He's making a statement about reality, about being, about metaphysics, when he says, and this is a quote from Tolkien, The realm of the fairy story, or fairy tale, is wide and deep and high and filled with many things. All manner of beasts and birds are found there, shoreless seas and stars uncounted. Beauty that is an enchantment and an ever-present peril, both joy and sorrow sharp as swords. In that realm, a man may perhaps count himself fortunate to have wandered. But why count yourself fortunate to have wandered somewhere that was a flight from reality? That would not be fortunate, that would just be a waste of time. So good fantasy is supposed to be a flight to reality, because this is not the reality that we see with our eyes every day. We see the banal, boring, and bland things that we simply have to deal with. We see the fluorescent lights and the plastic desks and the nylon carpets and conculus. We can just complain all day about Grand Hall. But um, you know, that's, the point is, the things that we are mundanely exposed to constantly they're very real, of course, but uh, if we don't ever try to rise above what the senses just relentlessly present to us, we might actually not be experiencing reality in all fullness. We might need to fly to reality with some good fiction, with some of the good work of fantasy, he's saying. The fundamental reason for the popularity of The Lord of the Rings is that people sense it is real. Not some mere escape from reality that can be voted as the greatest book of the century, as The Lord of the Rings was. Uh, by a long shot. Uh, and that is why Tolkien does not tell us half of what he knows about his world. You can tell everything about your fantasies, your dreams, your thoughts, but not about anything real. That is also why The Lord of the Rings bears endless rereading. It is heavy enough to bear the mind's journeys into it, like our world. In fact, it is perhaps the most heavy, full, detailed, complex, real, invented world in all human literature. So, sounds wild, I know. There's more in there I'd, I'd love to go through, but I, I don't think I'm going to for the sake of time, because I meant to get a little further in this today, and I will. We're not out of time just yet. But any thoughts on that? It's okay if you think it's all bogus, but I'm just curious to see. That's a bold claim. Which? Were you saying Lord of the Rings is the most... Uh, what was he saying? Well, it was, it was that it was voted as the greatest novel of now I can't remember what. No, but you, but you said it's the most uh, well-structured, you know. That is the most detailed, 
Oh, because you're thinking of Star Wars right now. Or well, something. I'm, thinking the, I'm thinking of the Marvel Universe, man. The what? The oh, well, yeah, yeah, okay. We've got we've got more today that's insanely detailed, yeah. So fair enough. So maybe it's not the most detailed complex. I mean, didn't you say it's the most like, real fantasy? That yeah, that's his real claim. It's the most real fantasy. Is, it's based off World War One. Based off of the, the whole world, the whole Lord of the Rings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. I don't know. <laughs> it's, um, it's, I mean, by the way, I haven't seen that movie that just came out about Tolkien. Have, is that, have you seen that? I've not seen Has anyone seen that? It's just, no, one, no one's seen it before. I, I kind of intended to and then didn't. Um, so anyway, maybe talk, I would, I would be curious to know more about that. But I, every author, as Pascal will insist, is revealed in his writings. And certainly World War I deeply shaped Tolkien. So that's uh, definitely going to seep into his, uh, his fiction, intentionally or unintentionally, I'm sure. So who's, uh, who's Voldemort? Not Voldemort. Who's, um, Sauron. who's Sauron? I know Mordor is supposed to be like a combination of like the definition of no man's land and Germany. OK, interesting. Very interesting. So it's, it, it's, the point is, it, the greatest of authors and the greatest of artists, they don't look at art as entertainment. That is the modern view of art. It's just something to distract ourselves for a bit and waste some time uh, enjoying. Art is supposed to be instructive. It is supposed to be so beautiful that it teaches you something that you already knew, but it reminds you of it. And it gives you not only a teaching, but a, but a strength to undertake it. Good art makes doing good easier. Um, and that's, I think, what we all feel if we really enjoyed some really good work of art, be it a book or a movie or even just a physical painting of some sort, a, a, a good um, uh, symphony of some sort. It's, it inspires us in the best of ways. And when we're talking about a work of fiction, ironically, Kree's point here is that it can be the most real of all things. We're not lying to ourselves and pretending there's such a person as Frodo. Obviously, there's not. The point is the principles and the values and the meaning embedded within these works of fantasy uh, are reality, them, reality itself. Those are the deepest and truest and best realities. Now, what are these things, though? Well, for Plato, there's a very clear answer to that. All those things are what? Neoplatonic. Yeah, they're forms. They're the, the object of our existence. They're ultimate reality itself. But for the kind of demythologized, rationalist view, there's not much room for what these things even are. They're just kind of epiphenomena. They're just kind of psychological side effects of, of, of which in turn are just side effects of biology, and they don't really mean much. They're kind of empty of, of value in the demythologized cosmos of post-enlightenment rationalism. So anyway, back to Pascal here. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the milieu, if you will, that he's operating within. And he's not condoning it. And the, our author is neither condoning it nor rejecting it here. He's just describing it, that this is this soundless emptiness of space frightens him. That's quite a quote. Uh, that you, ancient, God bless you, ancient man looks up at the cosmos and he sees, even just physically, in the stars themselves, he sees what? Exactly. He sees a whole story laid out before him. We've all learned about the constellations, I'm sure, in grade school. And many people have a, it's like a big hobby of theirs. I, I wish I knew more about them. I, all I know is, all I know is Orion's belt and the Big Dipper. There's a problem with Orion's belt now, isn't there? Who knows about this? Maybe it's his shoulder. You guys, you guys haven't heard about this? Betelgeuse. The star, the, the, when you look up in the sky, that red star, it might be about to explode because it's dimming all of a sudden. And uh, it might shine brighter than the full moon tonight. It might turn night into day soon. We don't have speculation. It could happen tomorrow. It could, have, could happen in thousands of years. We have no idea. But something's going on with Bezos. When did you find out about this? I just saw it on, like, the, on the mainstream news. Google it. I mean, I mean any, any time, if you want now or any time. But, uh, uh, <laughs> Given the speed of light, could it have already Yeah, happened? so it happened 600 years ago now. Whatever happened. We're, we're just speculating that it might have exploded. It's dimming now, which could be because of a burst of cloud, of, of cloud, a burst of stellar dust that's just dimming our view of it, 
or it could be diving in preparation for a supernova, which would be a problem because this supernovas happen all the time, but Betelgeuse is so close to us, being only 600 light years away. When you said that, I was like, what? Yeah, so, but it's true, right? You're, you're seeing it yeah. when you Google it? Yeah. yeah. So this might be a big deal pretty soon. We have no idea what it'll do. This has never happened before, so. Um, but it could be an unprecedented celestial phenomenon. Why did I think? Oh, yeah. So, so ancient man looks up at the stars and he sees the whole story right after him. Uh, modern man looks at the stars and sees only, only gas, sees only plasma particles. So this is, um, this is the contrast. And what does anyone recall from? Sorry, I'm again bringing up my intro fill class. But it's, the direct, it's like the same exact thing right here. The music of the shining heavenly bodies, what's that a reference to? It's right from our textbook. I heard that, I don't the ancient Greek philosophers thought that the motion of the, of the stars literally generated music. Like you look at a music box and it turns and you, can, and you hear this beautiful music come out of it. The ancients thought that the stars themselves were, were generating this incredible music constantly with, their, with the regular, regularity of their harmonious motion. They realized we can't hear it, of course. They, they, they realized that, but uh, they would wager that we could kind of hear it intellectually through these, uh, through philosophy maybe, or through this various mystical approaches that they took. All right, so looking at the yearning that Pascal has for meaning, but coming as he is from this, this culture of reductionistic, rationalistic, enlightenment thought, not that the Enlightenment had really transpired yet at his time, but it was, it was, it was certainly in its formative stages. Um, he has this kind of primal cry of despair that is, frankly, much more honest. This is a beautiful thing, but existentialism strives to be honest to what we're all feeling than the starry-eyed optimism of his confreres, of his peers. And he's deeply embedded within this conversation because remember, he's all read from a young age. He was discovering things, new things. He was, he was a part of this conversation that was happening in, uh, among the scholars of his day. How is it that this creature, who shows everywhere in comparison with other animals and with nature itself such evident marks of grandeur and power, is at the same time so feeble and miserable? We can only conclude, Pascal says, that man is rather like a ruined or disinherited nobleman cast out from the kingdom which ought to have been his. This he takes as his fundamental premise. This he takes as his fun fundamental premise, the image of man as a disinherited being. All right, what major tenet of existentialism does Pascal particularly promote? Brutal honesty regarding the human condition. He's constantly looking at how miserable our state is. You look at just, you look at all the various creatures in this earth, and most of them seem kind of happy, except us, who, who seem miserable. And yet, the ones who should, if you were to simply uh, rank where we should be in that spectrum, it seems we should be at the very top, considering our abilities. We, uh, we can do exponentially more than the very closest species to us, below us. And yet, we are exponentially more miserable, often. Usually, maybe you could even say. So what does this, Pascal looks at this and he says, what does this tell us about our nature? We must be messed up in some deep way. There must, clearly we are inclined towards this type of blessed life that it seems that our abilities are conducive towards or, or even deserve, you could say, and yet we are among the most miserable of the beasts. So, he concludes, let me see if we can squeeze a little bit more about that in here actually. Compare to the beasts, we are exalted, yet we are miserable. Animals 
don't hate their lives. People often do. What does he conclude? He concludes, we are noblemen, kings, queens, cast out of our kingdom. In other words, a disinherited being. Alright, why that analogy? A nobleman cast out of his kingdom, why is that what we are like? We're so far ahead of everyone else in the animal kingdom. Yeah, you cast a nobleman out of his kingdom, he's got to go live in the, in the uh, slums. He's still got, you know, he's probably still wearing his his royal garments, and his, uh, he's probably still got his crown, maybe, and he's got no dirt under his fingernails. He's got no, uh, you know, you know. He, he clearly, you look at him and, and you see, and that's a guy who should be in a palace, and he finds himself among this squalid misery and poverty. That's exactly what we're like. We have all of these abilities and traits and characteristics that seem that we should live this blessed life like the gods of Mount Olympus or something, and yet we often suffer more than the very beasts themselves and uh, in many cases are in a worse state than they are because although they suffer and die just like we do they don't have the despair and depression and anxiety and, and uh, deeper miseries that we have to deal with so the only, th the only conclusion that Pascal can draw is that we must be uh, made, designed for something much higher and yet we're stuck for now with something much lower the natural misfortune of our mortal and feeble condition, Pascal says, is so wretched that when we consider it closely, nothing can console us. Men escape from considering it closely by means of two sovereign anodynes. How do we, dis how do we escape? Does anyone recall from reading how Pascal says we escape from considering the misfortune of our feeble condition? Habit and distraction. Habit and distraction. I meant to have that on the discussion sheet, but I didn't. So don't worry, if it's on the discussion sheet, you won't be tested on it. But, um, so we, we are in such a miserable state of affairs that we have two things to carry us through those times where we're inclined to actually take a look at how things are in our lives. We have habits and we have distractions. Our habits just kind of keep us arbitrarily living the same life tomorrow that we lived yesterday. Read the last sentence. Sorry, this is disinherited being. Yeah. Okay. Um, is the one above it legible? The one above it is, he, he concludes that we are noblemen cast out of our kingdom. This isn't legible, I just can't see it from here. Oh, okay. Well, it tends to get more and more low, the lower I get. Just, Which line? Just the last one, I couldn't read it. This disinherited being. Disinherited. Di disinherited being. Yeah. Um, so, a sovereign anodyne. Yeah, I, I must admit, when I'm reading an art textbook, I sometimes have to look up what some of these words mean. I did not know what an anodyne even was, but it's a perfect term because it describes so much that you see in the world. Has anyone heard of anodyne before? If something is anodyne, it is like carefully, meticulously constructed to be completely and totally inoffensive, but also devoid of any value. Something that's Deliberately inoffensive. Uh, and don't get me wrong, it's good to not go around being offensive. That, that's not what we're going to But what, um, who are like the world's greatest experts at, at crafting, at constantly crafting anodynes? Politicians. Politicians, absolutely. Uh, occasionally, they're, 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 they seem to always be either unhinged and saying idiotic things or just saying empty statements that mean nothing and offend no one. And it seems there's rarely to be found statements of, of deep meaning. Yeah. Pa but I think even worse than politicians? Musical, music artists. Okay, maybe. If there's anything you find on Twitter, well, there's, there's plenty of actually deliberately offensive stuff in there. You know, one person, not person, but one source you will never find anything offensive from because they're too prudent for this. It's not good for their strategy. Corporate marketing PR statements. 
they are always there so long, they say nothing. They can respond to any situation, any issue that comes up, any employee that acts, just anything at all. Give it a couple hours. They will come out with a statement. Maybe it's a pretty long one that says absolutely nothing. <laughs> like every, like I don't know how they do it. They, 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 they can write entire statements day after day that say nothing. Because they say nothing, they also mean nothing and conveniently offend no one. That's their only goal, to offend no one. Because offending people means you lose business. So they're ex like this is actually what these professionals are trained to do. To come up with statements that don't say anything. But, hope, but make it look like they said something so that they can move on from this issue and, and, and just get back to making more money. Um, nothing is, I can't remember the last corporate, corporate statement on anything that's ever actually addressed an issue in a meaningful way. Because it, it's, it, it's almost never monetarily beneficial to address something in a meaningful way. So they don't, they, they come up with anodynes. Anyway, what Pascal is saying in our own lives, we have these with habit and, dis and diversion or distraction. So, it, well, we'll take a look at some more specific quotes from Pascal next class. I'm going to bring in some excerpts from the Ponce. But he, um, he particularly latches onto this idea of how a grown man can bounce a ball around. And somehow that can distract him from like, the most horrid recognitions in his life. Bounce a ball around, in other words, play sports. Play sports. And, but here's the ironic thing. He's not condemning that. You might think, oh, so we've got to stop distracting ourselves. Pascal is actually saying, no, you, you do have to distract yourself. <laughs> you actually do that. Too. Uh, don't, don't do it too much, because you do need to consider these important things also. But you can't be always um, consciously cognizant of the uh, other misery of our condition. You do have to distract yourself sometimes. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's, uh, let's leave it there and pick up with that in class. So have an excellent couple of days. I will see you. Thursday, if anyone needs the attendance sheet, I'll leave it right here. Oh, and uh, if anyone didn't get a quiz back from me, it's okay. I have it. Okay. So, uh, I, I don't know, I kind of don't want to completely finish this discussion sheet today for the sake of those not here, but we'll see. We'll see. Might let you out a few minutes early. I don't know. Um, we have just introduced Pascal at this point and talked a little bit about his philosophy. But he's not really, I mean, I consider him a philosopher. He's, his Ponce is philosophical, but he's not technically a philosopher. He's not an academic career philosopher. Then again, some of the best ones are not. Probably the best ones are not. Um, Socrates, above all. He was just some guy who went around talking to people on the streets. I still want to do that, by the way. I still want to have some class someday if they let me have us just go out. Walk around Troy, just talk to people on the streets about important questions. Somebody, somebody might stop you. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> the lawyers don't let anything happen these days. So everything's got to be within your little cubicle or, or classroom. Oh well. Um, so Pascal is most uh, most clearly a forerunner of existentialism in, and this is I think where we left off, his brutal honesty regarding the human condition. So you can have that down for the second question if you don't already. His brutal honesty regarding the human condition. His theory is, or his conclusion on this, is why is the human condition so miserable? Well, if we weren't meant for something infinitely greater, we wouldn't even be able to recognize ourselves as miserable. The mere, the mere fact that we, we can detect this misery in our lives seems to imply that we have at least an inkling, at least an intuition, of something vastly greater that is our inherent nature and yet which we lack. The beasts are not miserable and depressed and anxious and all that stuff. Uh, even though they suffer pain just like we do, they don't have the other issues that come along with our, uh, with our lives. Because, well, maybe they're not made for anything much more exalted than the condition they presently enjoy. It seems that we are. So Pascal says we are like a disinherited being. We are a nobleman cast out of a rightful kingdom. Um, and this, you know, it's not hard to see where his uh, religious inspiration for coming to this conclusion is. It's quite obvious in Christian, Islamic, and, Jew and Jewish scriptures. But 
Remember, he's philosophizing here. He's not appealing to uh, a scripture of any sort in order to demonstrate his arguments in this case. He is being, therefore, philosophical, not theological. Although he did have plenty of theological things to say as well, it's obviously not what we'll be focusing on here. Um, so the last thing I read to you was his, was his identification of those two things that we use to escape our miserable and wretched condition. What again are those two things? I didn't tell you to have them down, so you might not remember. So, distraction. Yes, distraction and habit. So these two things carry us through needing to even ponder the miserable nature of our current state. Now remember, this whole point of this for Pascal is not to dwell on the misery, but to use it as a recognition to uh, go for the only things that really count. For him, that would be God. And uh, he would, I'm sure, be rolling over in his grave. What's the word? Turning over in his grave? The, the phrase? Wait, what is it? Rolling. Yeah, if he knew that people were taking his fonse, his philosophy, to become these cynical, despairing, depressed people. Uh, even if he was not exactly a power of positive thinking optimist, he still, I don't think you could say, was any sort of rebel without a cause or anything like that. All right, so we say we see here, man chases a bouncing ball or rides to hounds after a fleeing animal. Or the ball and fleeing game are pursued through the labyrinth of social intrigue and amusement. Anything, so long as he manages to escape from himself. Or, solidly ensconced in habit, a good citizen, surrounded by wife and family, secure in his job, need not cast his eye on the quality of the days as they pass, and see how each day entombs some hope or dream forgotten, and how the next morning wakes him to a realm that becomes ever narrower and more congealed. Man, that is poetic. What is, did any of that stick with anybody? It's like dense poetry, you could say. It's, it doesn't sound like a textbook right now. Each passing day entombs something. Each passing day, he says, entombs some hope or dream forgotten. In tombs, meaning what? It puts it yeah. to rest. Puts it to rest, buries it. And this is our sorry state. Every day, each day, he brings with it the recognition that something we previously dedicated ourselves to was futile and vain. Vanity of vanity, all things are vanity. Where's that come from? Solomon. Yeah. That's from uh, ancient Hebrew text, Solomon. The, uh, I can't remember, whatever, it doesn't matter what book. But yeah, ancient Hebrew text. Um, wisdom. Wisdom, thank you. The, the wisdom of Solomon. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's certainly what Pascal is expounding upon here. Much more, uh, much more zealously than probably even the Book of Wisdom itself does in Solomon's words. All right. Both habit and diversion, so long as they work, conceal from man his nothingness, his forlornness, his inadequacy, his impotence, and his emptiness. That's Pascal directly. That for Pascal, religion is the only possible cure for this desperate malady that is nothing other than our ordinary mortal existence itself. So let's pause here and consider. Uh, we, we, I think we all know at this point what exactly Pascal wants us to conclude from the misery and wretchedness of our present condition. But what else, or let me ask you, is there anything else that can be gained that makes the consideration of the misery of our state worth pondering? What, what good could come from that? Well, yeah, so that's certainly what Pascal wants us to turn to, is God. And I'm not going to argue against that. I, Heck, I, I, I agree with Pascal. But what else can, what, what other good can come from considering the misery of our present state? The radical finitude and contingency of it. 
that you only have so much time exactly. to actually have. Exactly. This is also a huge theme of Heidegger, who had nothing to say about religion one side or the other. This, this, I don't want to say obsession, because that would not be good, but this complete honest recognition of our finitude and contingency is going to make us take more seriously the time that we are given. It's going to make us not endlessly put off and procrastinate what we know we must do, because we don't have very long to do it. The, uh, he makes these points very well. We'll continue to uh, revisit these throughout the upcoming existentialists. I have a note here. You may have noticed it from the reading. You may have not. Pascal says, all philosophy, it seems, he said this at one point at least, is not worth an hour. An hour. <laughs> it's not worth an hour's bother. Uh, now, remember the context he's saying this in. He was actually engaged in, in dialogue with people like Descartes, this, this new wave of, of philosophy. And I think this is primarily what he has in mind when he says it's not worth an hour's bother, because so much of what he says reminds me, in fact, of what you see in ancient Greek philosophy, in medieval. But um, he, this, this endless debating of the minutia and the hair splitting of all of these philosophical questions that scarcely matter at all, if at all, period. He says that's all not worth an hour's bother. And I, uh, I've complained about this in the past, and I'm sure I'll continue to do so. I must say I sympathize with him in some respects. I mean, I love philosophy, don't get me wrong. But in some, the ways it's undertaken, in some contexts, is just precisely what Pascal says is not worth an hour's bother. Uh, this, this endless debating about the details of arguments, the very conclusions to which probably don't even matter. That's not useful. Pascal sees no use in that. In this respect, he resembles Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, philosophers who went beyond philosophy, and so were able to see how it looked from the outside, from the point of view of religion and art, in their cases, and from that of science in his. How something looks from the outside. To be able to see how philosophy looks from the outside is not something that, his, that the philosophers of his day seemed capable of doing. They were so wrapped up within it that there's a saying that uh, if you are so concerned about the details of something and you completely miss the, um, the real important questions at hand, but you're obsessive about these details. There's an old saying that perfectly illustrates this. The Titanic is going down and you're going down with it. You're going down with it, exactly. But instead of trying to grab a lifeboat, maybe, or something, you are um, rearranging the deck chairs. Rearranging the deck chairs while the, while, while the Titanic is sinking. Or, as another, another phrase you may have, this may be more common, fiddling your thumbs, fiddling your thumbs or twiddling your thumbs, or fiddling while, did anyone heard this? Did I hear it? Uh, fiddling while Rome burns. That's another one. Fiddling while Rome burns. Um, so that's what, uh, that's, what philo that's what philosophy has begun to seem like in this age that Pascal is writing. Birth of Cartesian philosophy, and so on. Um, he's looking at it. So Nietzsche and uh, uh, Kierkegaard are able. To, they, are, they are philosophers in a real sense. Maybe they're even not primarily philosophers, but they're able to philosophize while seeing what philosophy looks like from the outside. And the more we move in a direction as a society towards a certain, towards a certain economic, thing of economic value, the less we have people who are able to see what their own specialty, what their own field looks like from the outside. Anyone remember from our earlier discussion what that might be? In economics especially, we, say, we see, or at least we say in capitalism, that all economic benefit is derived from Specialization of labor. 
And the more and more specialized we get, the more we become cogs in a wheel. And the less we can see the meaning of the very thing we are engaged in, the less we are capable of objectively taking an outside look at what we're doing and seeing if it actually fits at all with the human condition, with the meaning of life, so on and so forth. And that, in fact, those are the very questions that the specialist does not want to ask himself. Um, we have entire lives, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not condemning this, by the way. This, this is great for people who are called to it, but it certainly wasn't for me. Like, if you become an engineer in some realms, in some corporate entities, you're going to spend your entire life, your entire career, decades and decades, optimizing one little piece of one component that is in turn a part of a subassembly, which in turn is part of a reactor or something, or a turbine, or a car. And again, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not to be condemned in and of itself. We need our part components optimized. But the problem is when we wrap up our meaning in, in our very life too closely to these pursuits that we're engaged in, it's fairly easy, perhaps, for someone who really is working on such a fine-tuned detail of an overall project to see that um, he ought not identify his meaning with this, this little thing he's after. But perhaps it's a little harder for someone who's engaged in some other pursuits to, take to, um, to come to that same recognition. So, existentialism reminds us, it begs of us, to not uh, derive our meaning from something that society gives us as our task to accomplish. To not be reduced to an economic conflict. Or a tool. Or a tool, yeah. We're about to get to the next point on what types of mind we can distinguish between. Uh, one more point I have here highlighted. Here was a different kind of data from that he had dealt with in his mathematical and physical research. He's talking about now the, the, uh, the study of the human mind and the human nature. And not only was the material different, but it required an altogether different kind of intelligence for its comprehension. Pascal, unlike Spinoza, was too intelligent not to recognize that doing geometry was altogether different from the study of man. All right, Spinoza, has anyone ever heard of him? Is a... Uh, a quintessential rationalist philosopher. He was one of the heralds of the Enlightenment. A rationalist philosopher, remember, is one who believes that everything and anything can be conquered by a simple, logical application of reason alone, and nothing more is needed, and anything outside of that approach is... Illogical. Yeah, it's just garbage. Yeah, it's just not even to be garbage. Yeah. So if it's, yeah, if it's extra logical, it's illogical for a rationalist. So Spinoza, being the quintessential rationalist, would want us to approach all questions even the questions about our very meaning and purpose and who we are, what all we do, with the same logical precision and approach that we do geometry. That can't work, Pascal says. And Pascal, I love how polemical the uh, author is here of our textbook, he says, Pascal was too intelligent to think <laughs> that that kind of intelligence can work for all <laughs> such, for all questions. He was too... Uh, and, and look, he actually proved that he had the intelligence of precisely that sort, as we talked about last class. But there's no denying he was insane and intelligent in that regard. And yet he was honest enough about the nature of that type of intelligence that he realized it could not solve all of the world's problems. And it cannot tell us who we are, where we're going, what, what our meaning is. So he distinguished between what two kinds of mind? This was, yeah, so mathematical versus intuitive mind. Um, oh, maybe I'll give a little tip here. Back in my days of doing SAT prep training, I would uh, remind students, never leave a paragraph without knowing what the main point of that paragraph was. Um, this, a lot of people got this question wrong, and it was a tricky one, don't, I understand that. But bear in mind that the entire um, last paragraph of page 114 and first paragraph of 115 is entirely about this distinction. So if, if in the future, like as you're doing readings, you kind of try to make sure that 
you don't leave a whole page without knowing its main point, you'll be in pretty good shape. Okay, so there's mathematical mind versus the intuitive mind. This is not, he's not categorizing people so much here. This isn't the point here, isn't the point of someone and say, oh, you're a mathematical mind, and someone else, you're intuitive mind. We have, everybody has the capacity for both, some admittedly one more than the other, uh, which you'll recognize pretty quickly if you hang out at my alma mater. RPI, uh, that clearly some who have the mathematical lack the intuitive. But anyway, we all do have both, and we can uh, and must use both. But they're different. They, come to, they, they approach questions in different ways. Out of, this realization, out of this realization that we previously discussed came this distinction. Because it kept sight of Pascal's distinction, the author says here, and I cannot confirm this on my own, I've never even been there, French culture never quite surrendered itself to the clear and distinct ideals of Descartes. The clear and distinct, okay, I can't even start to go into that, that would be a huge tangent, but Descartes' clear and distinct ideas are what his famous cogito itself is built upon. If you see something clearly and distinctly, only then, then and only then do you know it's true, and only conclusions that follow from those clear and distinct ideas are themselves worthy. Now, Ironically, Descartes was a Frenchman, and yet it was precisely French culture who that, that uh, regarded Pascal's distinction here as important. And if you realize that this is important, then you're not going to reject a, a conclusion, you're not going to reject a set of knowledge, just because it doesn't derive from this type of reasoning process. Anyone been to France? Yes, we have a few people who've been to France. Want to share your uh, your thoughts on France? Did you like it? I did like it. You liked it? Okay. Um, it was very clean, I guess. Hmm, but the good. one thing that I noticed there was a lot of people smoked. Yeah, and I've heard a lot of people. It was really interesting because obviously here there's we have more precautions against dogs, like going uh, to restaurants and like uh, not letting them into certain places. But in France, it's like you can bring your dogs everywhere. Uh, like we were sitting in fancy restaurants and there would be like dogs having their own like seat. At, like, <laughs> so, Interesting. So they like yeah. dogs and they like smoking. Yes. They it's also great. were very nice and definitely knew a lot of more English than, okay, I, knew more English than, than okay. I knew French. So that was very nice. So go to France, but bring your, bring your cigarettes and your dog with you. Okay. Yeah. Any thoughts uh, on like the feel of the culture there in terms of, so what our author, and I'm just asking this because I've never been there and I want to hear from people who have, our author is arguing that there is this type of sense of culture that France seems to not have lost, but that many other European nations, and certainly America, since it even came into being after the Enlightenment, really has lost, that this... Yeah, it's hard. It's hard for me to. I think I know what he's getting at. It's hard for me to describe it. Though. This, you could almost say medieval. This, this sense of, of artistic grandeur and greatness and importance, and you know, like the famous art museum there, the Louvre, that they call the Louvre. Oh, yeah. Like, so that that, mm -hmm. that they have a, an appreciation of these things that other nations and cultures seem to have lost. But does that resonate at all with you? Yeah. People have been there. They definitely have a very a, a lot of appreciation for art. For instance, there's this whole bridge that's, it's like, it's called, I can't remember, but it's where people put, like, locks on them. Yeah. On the oh, yeah. And they I, write their names. I saw and, that in the news recently, yeah. but didn't they take them all off? Yeah, take them all oh, yeah, they take them all off. They took, because it was getting too heavy or something? Yeah. Uh, but, um, yes, outside of the Louvre, it's cool. I don't see any difference between France and all the uh, other. You don't? Okay. European countries, no. Okay. I feel like we're very close-minded as a, like, as a country because most of us only know English and like mm -hmm. you go to like Europe and it's like they know five languages they yeah. know. but like I don't know we're I feel much like more on, just a half we're, we're much more on this country. side we're yeah. very pragmatic here because yeah. incredibly pragmatic even like the metric system like like the only people oh yeah well, like, like, I don't know yeah that's kind of I, I think we're close-minded. Uh, because uh, I was okay. I went to Sweden, <laughs> <school, laughs> and, and they grow up speaking oh, German, yeah. English, yeah. and yeah. French. Right. So when we were on the, like, the trains uh, going to Sweden, it was super interesting because people would talk in German, but then when they would switch to English, and they would switch to French. Uh, wow. So that was really cool to like, kind of see. Wow. Yeah, we definitely aren't 
very open-minded to learning other languages. Yeah, yeah, we we're, were very monolingual. Yeah. That's, uh, that's true. Did you have any thoughts on France? I mean, it was all like tourists who were going like to the Eiffel Tower, right, to right. the Louvre, to the uh, to everything. So, uh, is it really that? I don't know. That's why I'm. I, just, over there are, I uh, maybe this all is wrong. Maybe French culture has lots of distinction, just as many, just as much as other places have. Or maybe, but but he's assuming that that Pascal's distinction here, people in France especially took very seriously. Uh, but you know, today this is almost outdated because today most people do realize the existence of multiple categories of intelligences. I am no psychologist, but don't they rank? Don't they? There's like social intelligence. There's three types. Three types they say today. Yes, there, then there's like subgenres, but it's mostly like three types, and everyone has like two. Okay. Okay. And then maybe next year they'll identify four or five or six. But the point is, Pascal says there's multiple. That's, that's the key uh, distinction here, is that he's acknowledging the existence of multiple. Finally, we're starting to get less obsessed with those stupid things that they call IQ tests. They're wastes of time. It doesn't matter what your IQ is. So for, like, it would, they're as if one number could tell you your intellectual worth is absurd. Uh, so thankfully, we're starting to realize that that's the case, and uh, how much more of a holistic view we need to take to the human mind than just reducing it to how powerful of a computer it is. You know, that's one great way of uh, pondering your worth and your meaning. Don't identify your meaning as something that could be done just as well, if not better, by a computer. You're setting yourself up for a real crash if you do that. You turn yourself, besides, even practically speaking, you turn yourself into a computer, it's just a matter of time until the computer takes your job. So, uh, that's, and, that, and that happens and that will continue to happen, but still, try and reserve your deepest zeal for things that a computer could never do. Computers can never be creative, and they can never love, they can never, uh, revere beauty, they can, you know, those properly human things are the things that we should really try to find our meaning in. All right, sorry, just uh, tangent there. Okay, because it kept sight of Pascal's distinction, he argues French culture didn't completely surrender to that trend. Now, the mathematical mind, as Pascal describes it, is defined precisely by its preoccupation with clear and distinct ideas, from which it is able to extract by deduction an infinite number of logical consequences. But the material with which the intuitive mind is dealing is so concrete and complex that it cannot be reduced to clear and distinct ideas that can be set forth in a few simple axioms. The intuitive mind is after concreteness. It is after things that cannot be reduced to simple logical assertions. When you intuit something, and this has come up in previous classes and other, other contexts. Sometimes you can intuit something and really know that it's true, but you could have a hard time what? Exactly. You could have a hard time proving to someone else why it's true, even if you know it's true, even if you really do know it. Think about tying your shoes. Soon I gotta teach my uh, five-year-old to tie his shoes, because that's probably about, he probably should be able to do so by now. So uh, I'm not looking forward to that, because what's the problem about trying to teach someone to tie their shoes? You just want to do it. They, what's that? I, whenever I try to do something, I just want to do it. You just want to do it for them, yeah, that's the first problem. Verbalizing it. Verbalizing it, yeah. They will miss it out. Yeah, and, and the, other, the first problem, they have no experience. They have no experience. And maybe even a deeper problem than that, is that you have no idea how to tie your shoes. In terms of explaining it, you just do it. You know, like, you, you, you don't even know what you do. You don't even need to. Uh, you the whole thing with, like, being rabbit. Yeah, the rabbit, and I gotta learn all that now. So, I gotta learn how to tie my shoes. I, think I don't have to, like, is, like, describing how to, like, 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 you just kind of have to balance. Like, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Like, you kind of just have to be like, okay, don't fall. Right, like, you, and that doesn't work. And, and so, this is so important, don't get me wrong, and this doesn't just mean numbers math. By this, Pascal is referring to logical deduction in general. This is so important. We must never doubt conclusions that we come to 
by a logical deduction. But we also have to be honest that most of what we actually have to do in life is not going to fall into that category. So we're going to have to take the other half of our mind seriously that intuits things. I, you know, speaking of children, the other thing that you'll realize as a parent, if, if you are really honest about what you're doing, you're not directly teaching your kid most of the things that they pick up. It's like, so my children start learning to talk at one, two years old. And sure, you tell them what certain words mean, and, and you point to something you give a word for, sure. But you don't tell them, okay, so hold your tongue in this exact way, and, and, and move this part of your mouth like this, and then put... You only very occasionally have to do that. If they have a speech impediment of some sort, you can try to do some speech therapy, but that's, that's the exception. Normally, they're around you saying these things, and they just what? Repeating? They, they just... What's that? Repeating, whatever it is. Yeah, they can just do it. They just have this inbuilt ability to, as long as they're exposed to it enough times, start doing it themselves. You don't really teach the vast majority of that. They have it in them. And it's, it, it's, it, it falls into this category. We don't grow out of that as we grow older. That gets actually more important as we grow older. Being honest about these things that we simply know, even if we can't logically uh, demonstrate them. Now, we should take logical demonstrations seriously still, but we should not restrict our knowledge to just that. All right. Uh, there's not much more. I don't want to really give you anything more about that. I suppose since I ask, though, on the sheet, I'll say French culture held on to some pre-enlightenment goods more than other cultures. And whether or not that's true, I don't know, but we'll just have that down for now. So much was abandoned with the enlightenment rationalism. French culture held on to a lot of it better. Which is ironic, since the Enlightenment itself finds its pinnacle in something that happened in France. Namely, the French Revolution. had really seen in order to have arrived at this distinction was this. Man himself is a creature of contradictions and ambivalences, such as pure logic can never grasp. This was something the philosophers themselves also had not yet grasped. Sorry, my computer's blocking some people. French culture held on to some pre-enlightenment goods more so than other European cultures. Many of my R's look like V's, don't they? I'm going to have to work on that. I'm really going to work on that. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll try to remember to say it a couple times. He reminds us again, as a mathematical genius, he had all the power and glory of that type of reason. And yet he had the humility, I suppose you could say, to recognize its limitations. The problem is, when you get real geniuses in something, they tend to lack humility, because they, they tend to want others to regard them as having it all figured out in accordance with their own particular set of skills. Skills they've acquired over a very long career. Sorry, no one knows that quote, do you? No, it's not a movie. Um, the, uh, so, so thank goodness to Pascal and his unique situation for giving us that distinction. All right, so now it comes to another point, and I do feel a little bad about this question I had in the quiz, because it was a tough one. Uh, but it's, he, it, said, it points out here that rational, we get now to the question of God, because remember from Pascal, it's all about God. Rational proofs for the existence of God, so, such proofs Pascal held, are beside the point. He didn't care about them. Uh, he said, one day they seem valid to us, the next day they do not. And if we postpone our salvation until the proofs are satisfactory, we shall stand forever wavering from one foot to the other. There are today, Pascal said, extremely intelligent minds who find the proofs for the existence of God entirely convincing, and equally intelligent minds that find them misconceived or inconclusive, and each side suspects the other of bad faith. That's ironic use of words there, in other words, of, of a bad approach. But the fact is that the proofs convince those who want to be convinced and fail to convince those who do not want to be convinced. 
And so they are not really proofs at all. Uh, I, I personally wouldn't take as uh, cynical a view of those ar various arguments, but Pascal certainly does. So as we talked about a couple classes ago, his famous wager has nothing to do with a proof of God's existence, does it? Who, who again remembers what the wager is? It's a it's a it's a early application of game theory. You know, you you, which is does not apply primarily to games, but it's a, you you chart out every potential course of action and every uh, potential effect of each successive course of action. You put it all on a grid, and when you have that grid in front of you, you can uh, much more strategically decide what to do. Yeah, wasn't the wager like? The odds are so much higher of there being a god than anything else. He actually doesn't even address the odds. For even the odds seem to not matter for him. I don't know, maybe they do, but I haven't, I haven't read the whole point say, but... He basically says, look, okay, make a little graph here, make a little chart with four boxes. And no, nothing says to you in the story. It's not in the book. Either. If you put... I've never actually done this, I hope I do this right. If you put on your rows, God exists, and then down here, God doesn't exist. And then you put up here, uh, believe, slash obey, God, and you put here, reject God. I'm not, I'm not quoting this directly because I can't remember exactly what he says. Then you can fill out each square with the effect of, the, of, of each approach. Does that make sense? So uh, you go to the God exists row here. Within each square, you could put a all set or screwed, uh, I suppose. So right here, all set. Right here, not good. God doesn't exist. Right here, all set. Right here, all set. Um, so the only col the only x in that chart is under which column? The reject, the reject God column. So that's the only flatly illogical course of action Pascal says, aside from any logical proof or logical uh, refutation of God's existence. So that's his wager, and that wager, according according to the logic of that wager, the logical proof or lack thereof of God is completely irrelevant. It doesn't even really matter. Uh, which is quintessentially existential. And, and I, uh, it, it, I think it goes too far. It would just be completely ambivalent to logical proofs for or against such things. But still, there's some, there's some intuitive wisdom in it. All right. What can we have down for that? He says they are besides the point. He's, I suppose you could say, being quite an extreme voluntarist here, in, the, in, such, a, in, a, in such a way as those believe, people believe whatever they want to believe, and that is the sole thing deciding what they believe. Contrast that to a more intellectualist view, where what you believe is determined by, well, what would, what would the other view be? So the, the one view is, in terms of, ex the one view for explaining people's beliefs is people believe what they want to believe. The other view then would be people believe what they're told. What they're told, certainly. That, I, uh, maybe that counts as a, a third category. People believe what has been demonstrated to their reason to be true. And that if something has been adequately demonstrated to your reason to be true, you actually lack, you categorically lack the ability to reject it, and vice versa. Snowing. Um, I see that it's snowing, therefore I believe that it's snowing. And I have no, it is not possible for me to deny that it's snowing. Could be ash. Well, that, well, yeah, so I could be mistaken. That's, that's, a good, that's true, I could be mistaken in my premise. I see white stuff falling, conclude snow, yeah. So, but the, the point is, the, um, 
the, the intellectual, the Pascal is, is kind of rejecting that. He's saying, no, you're going to believe what you want to believe. And that's basically all there is to it. That would be a, a, a very heavily, extremely existentialist view here, probably over the top, but worth considering. All right. So besides the point, you choose what to believe and who you are. Now, what's the problem if a so-called choice is completely constrained by the reasons presented to the will? That would that would come in certainly. Yeah, that, I'm sure that's related to what I have in mind now. Although I have something even a little more, a little more simple in mind first. Like, so if if something you choose is simply the result of what a clear argument demonstrates to be true, that choice you could say is it's constrained. Would be the technical term for it. It's constrained. And if it's constrained, then it's deterministic. And if something is deterministic, then you do not praise it. You don't praise this piece of chalk for moving when it's flipped because it was constrained. And yet, for an act of the will that really defines us to be praiseworthy or blameworthy, it seems that it cannot be entirely constrained. It's got to somewhat well up from the realm of mystery. And by making that choice, that somewhere within the domain of mystery, you somehow define your meaning because you are acting outside of the realm of simple constraints and determinations. Uh, that's a more complicated way of putting this. You choose what to believe and who you are. Fundamentally, it's not just about figuring out what's true and submitting to it. Even more primarily, it's about choosing who you want to be. Maybe that's the case. Um, the, there, there is some insight in this, certainly, if generally, maybe this is cynical of me to think, but generally, people will believe whatever they spend the most time researching. This is why, people, like, manipulators know <laughs> if they really want to get someone to believe something, they'll just say, oh yeah, just go research it. You'll, you'll, you'll just, just do the research, because they know that if you, quote, do the research, You'll just believe whatever you research it eventually, once you do it. If you want to believe that something's healthy, hop online and do a Google search for health benefits of blank. Insert thing into the blank. If you want to believe that something's harmful, hop online and do harmful health effects of blank. Insert the same thing into the blank. Whichever one you decide to spend your time researching is probably what you're going to believe. So what makes you decide what to research? That question itself is not the determined one. What if you're just researching just to argue against it? Yeah, so then, yeah, then you're, that's a good question. Then what will you yeah, wind you're up? You're looking to poke holes. Because then you're looking to poke holes in the, yeah. You're going to synthesizing something? Yeah, maybe you'll wind up being the synthesizer. That's a good point. Maybe you'll wind up being the one to find the, uh, and I'm not advocating for a despairing approach to finding the truth on things. You, you can. It's just, the more information that's out there, ironically, you think it makes it easier to find the truth? It makes it harder, doesn't it? Because you have an... In uh, almost impossible task in front of you, sorting through what's trustworthy and what's not, what's relevant and what's not. And so you have someone tell you what's trustworthy and what's not. Well, what's the next question? The person. Are they trustworthy? <laughs> exactly. So it's, it, our job is not any easier than it ever has been. Just as important as, as, it, as it ever has been, but it's not easier just because of the sheer quantity of information we have access to. Simple completely uncontroversial facts. Sure, we have an easier time today knowing those. But knowing the obvious answer to completely simple and clear, uncontroversial questions also doesn't get us as far. It doesn't, doesn't really tell us who we are, who we should be, what we should do with ourselves. All right. You choose what to believe and who you are. So ensure the direction of your choice is what you really want.
You choose what to believe in who you are, so ensure that the direction of your choice is what you really want. And that that's even more important than endlessly agonizing over whether your conclusion is fully formed or not. First, make sure your conclusion is actually what you really want. So, of course, it all hinges in this word really, though. You've got to be completely and brutally honest with yourself. Because what you want right now is probably a cheesecake. Like, that's what I want right now. But it's lunch, so I'm not going to have cheesecake. What we really want is we have to dig very deep within ourselves to re even know what we really want. And that's what existentialism begs us to do. Dig deep within yourself. Would you go as far as to say what you need? Or is that not it's even greater. Things? Because what, you, what we need, a need usually implies, if something's like an absolute need, what we tend to mean by that is that it's what? A necessity. For survival. For survival, yeah. But we don't need survival. So we're all going to die anyway. Which is what also what existentialism is begging us to remember. So what we really want is even deeper than what we need. Cool. Hopefully we'll get what we need for a while. I don't, don't go being reckless, please. But, um, but still, what we really want is deeper even than that. And no one can tell you what that is. It's radically individual. Uh, this doesn't mean that you've got to make it up for yourself. That's what Nietzsche will say. You've got to make it up for yourself. It's not to be found anywhere. But it's not at all what Pascal and it's not what existentialism in general is saying. It's saying it's got to be completely personal. You've got to claim the meaning. So really it's like just what you're trying to get out of life? Like what Absolutely. You what, what is it that you ultimately in your <clears throat> deepest heart of hearts want out of life? You better make your choices in accordance with that, whatever it happens to be. Because whatever that is, if you really are for yourself, you can really discover what it is. The choices that are conducive to it are not going to be the easy, comfortable, safe choices. Sometimes they will be, mostly they won't be. Mostly the easy, comfortable, safe, pleasurable choices are precisely the ones that drag us away from what we really, deeply want. So the existentialists are begging us to be authentic, in other words. Pascal, certainly. Now, in, a, in order to be really authentic, what's required of that, many times, is uh, I, I wish I had something about this in the discussion sheet, I don't. Is remembering. Simply remembering. Remembering what? I don't know. But you do. You've all had times where you've just known, with that intuitive dimension of your mind, that you were closest to the truth, that you were closest to the good, that you were closest to grasping who you are and what you must do. We've all had those experiences, I know you have. You might forget it at the moment, but you've had them. The key is to not forget those moments. The key is to not allow yourself to forget those moments. Because we will forget if we just drift. If we just go about each day doing what we got to do and that's it. If we just drift along with life, we will forget those moments. Pascal took that moment so seriously that he what? He wanted to make sure he didn't forget his existential moment. Do you remember what he did? Did he like write a book or something? He did write a book. He had a journal, definitely. He wrote about these things. But the problem is, you write a journal, you might put it in a drawer and just forget about it. Didn't he have like something sewed into his pocket? Yeah. Yep. He sewed it into his clothes. Mm -hmm. A reminder for him of, uh, of the superlative importance of this event. And it, from the outside, it doesn't seem like anything that special. Well, what was it? It was like it was a carriage accident, right? The, yeah. Yeah, he almost he, died. Yeah. yeah, he almost died in a carriage accident. And no, sort of, of course, almost died is a big deal. Uh, but he, okay, it says here, he himself had a religious experience connected with what he thought was a miraculous recovery from an illness. So overpowering had been the visitation that he wrote down a note about the experience and sewed it into his clothing, as if it were a secret that he had to keep as close as possible to himself and never forget. But we may think of the validity of such experiences. For Pascal, him, sorry, whatever we may think of the validity of such experiences, for Pascal himself, this lightning from heaven needed no proofs. It was the order of life itself, not rational theology. His life thereafter turned round that single shattering experience, and he, and he then dedicated his life to religion. So, he knew that for him to be authentic with that moment that he was closest to the truth, he had to dedicate himself to his religion. 
Um, he's, uh, he, you can't claim Pascal's moment as your own because his life is not yours. But again, your, your, your job is to not remember whatever those moments are for you. And you've had some, you'll probably have more. Whenever they come, do something to make sure you never forget it. You could sew something into your clothing. Uh, there's plenty of other things you could do. You could wear something every day. I know I do. You could, uh, you could make something part of your daily routine. That's another great way of never forgetting something. If you do this, if you, if you have something that you do every single day, every morning, every evening, before bed maybe, you gotta do something to make sure you never forget it. Existential moments. No writer has expressed more powerfully than Pascal the radical contingency that lies at the heart of human existence. The contingency that may at any moment hurl us all unsuspecting into non-being. Death does not arrive punctually by appointment. Now remember, Pascal is his whole point is that he deeply realizes he doesn't think you're literally going to stop existing when you die. But he does think that you're that everything you know about life ceases at that moment. Everything you thought you've ever known life to be is gone, like that. Uh, so, for him, he was you know, focus on what comes next, but don't uh, delude yourself into supposing you can be ultimately fulfilled by this, by this contingent thing. But again, this is not only the religious existentialists who say this. Heidegger, one of his most famous quotes, his single piece of advice, when asked what the takeaway concrete advice was of his philosophy, he said, spend more time oh, he What's that? With family. With family? That's a good that's good advice. But he has something a little more morbid to say. Who is the only guy who said that though? You hear that a lot, and it's good advice. I don't know who exactly uh, said it. Many, many wise people in the job. That's certainly what most people regret most in their deathbeds. They spend so much time and effort in these stupid goals and money making and whatnot, and they neglect the actual people in their lives. Um, but Heidegger says, spend more time in... I thought I said this, maybe I didn't. Spend more time in graveyards, Heidegger says. That's his concrete advice for Heidegger. Why? <laughs> because it reminds you of how contingent you are. It reminds you of death. And it... It's not intended to make you despondent and despairing. It's intended to make you take more seriously your time here on Earth before that impending moment. Um, it's, you know, you might say, oh, I'll live on people's memories. Well, probably not. People are going to forget you after you die really quickly, as we forget all people pretty quickly after they die. So you really just got to make, make it work right now. You got to do what you got to do now. And you can't procrastinate it. I personally love going. I just I love spending time in cemeteries. I know I've, I've said that before, I think, but uh, it's it, it, it's maybe maybe that maybe that I have an existential so hard, but um, it's they're also very peaceful and beautiful places. They're one of the only places around you can actually get away from the, the advertisements and the music and ugliness, and you know, they're very peaceful. So spend more time in great the art side of your set. Not I'll go ahead and concur with them on that. Contingency, the radical non-necessariness of you is probably the easiest way of putting contingency. You are incredibly unnecessary. <laughs> How does that feel to hear? <laughs> we're used to being told we're so important, we're so special, we're so unique. Pascal said you, you're nothing. <laughs> This is for the next question, Dan. What does he mean about contingency? By contingency. Mm -hmm. The universe, the world, got along just fine before you were born. It'll get along just fine after you're gone. You are incredibly unnecessary. <laughs> um, this, this is, too, not meant to be depressing. It's meant to be liberating. But how exactly will it continue on here? In the ages of scholastic philosophy, the nothing, the nihil, had been purely conceptual entity, an empty abstraction that lay at the farthest reaches of thought. But for Pascal, it was no longer an abstraction but an experience. 
At a certain moment of his existence, nothingness had suddenly and drastically revealed itself to him. Thereafter, Pascal searched everywhere for evidences of the contingent in human existence. The length of Cleopatra's nose, which altered the destinies of Mark Antony and the Roman Empire. The grain of sand in Cromwell's kidney that put an end to his military dictatorship. And long before Heidegger and Sartre introduced their jaw-breaking names for all the categories that define human contingency, especially absurdity. That's just mine out there. Pascal had seen that to be born is itself for the individual the prime contingency, since it means to be born at this time, at this place, to these parents, in this country. All of these brutally given facts on which his life has to seek to found itself. So we build our lives on all of these radically contingent facts. We ourselves are radically contingent. History itself, even. That's what he's talking about here, bringing up Cleopatra's nose and Mark Antony. I don't even know what he's talking about here. Does any of the history buff want to explain that for us? We're having an affair? No? Yes. I don't, I don't know. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear I just Google it. They were having an affair. Oh, they were having an affair. Oh, yeah. There's something like that. Like... It started. But like, and it started, yeah, so, but ha all of this derives from these seemingly ridiculous causes, and yet they seem to alter the course of history, so you can't even make sense of history itself, he says, by looking at it, much less your own life. Um, now, it does ultimately make sense for Pascal, being a deeply religious man, but the analogy often used is that of a tapestry. Has anyone ever looked at the back of a tapestry? What does it look like? The same thing as the front, just a, just a different uh, shade. Mm -hmm. the tapestry, like uh, those big cloths like that are woven, like an actual woven one, with, oh, with, the, with the threads completely hanging down on the opposite side. Uh, it's That's, ugly. Yeah, it's hideous. Like, you, you can get kind of an idea by looking at it of what the tapestry is actually like, what it actually represents, but not a very good one. Um, all these seemingly random threads hanging all over the place, distorting the image, and, and haphazardly there and there. It's, it, it's pretty ugly. So tapestries, you know, they're hung against walls so that you don't see both sides. You're only, you're only supposed to see the, the front side of it. Uh, that's what... So Pascal is saying, looking at our own lives, and even history itself, this side of the grave at least, it's like looking at the back side of the tapestry. You can't even make sense of it. It's not even bother trying, basically. Uh, that's how contingent and arbitrary and even absurd things seem to be. He's not saying they ultimately are that way. Certainly not. Sartre will say, and Nietzsche will say things ultimately are that way. So I guess I'll bring up some contrast now. So Pascal is saying claimingly, Kierkegaard is saying claimingly. It's out there claiming. Just don't, don't pretend you can argue yourself and just claim it. Make the leap of faith. Nietzsche, Sartre, et al. will be saying there isn't a meaning at all to be found, so create one yourself. So you can see how those both qualify as existential, but they're extremely different. Make a meaning versus claim a meaning. Um, so this is a good time for me to try and make that in a few words for you guys. Okay, so this relates to the absurd in Sartre. Everything is absurd, so... Nietzsche, for example, <coughs> says, make your own meaning, slash morality. Will to power. Just will it. Whatever it happens to be, just will it. Two, 
Pascal slash Kierkegaard. You're not, they're also saying you're not going to figure it out, so don't bother, but make a leap of faith. Claim a meaning. It's out there. You're not making it up, you're claiming it, but you're still a leap. Pascal is this terror at the immensity of what surrounds us. That you look up at the sky, perhaps especially at night, and especially with the Copernican, you know, the, the changes in, in astronomical thought in his day, it's terrifying to even think of the, in, the quasi infinite amount of space out there. So I just want to say, are we so when it comes to this, are we talking like, are we saying you don't matter in the grand scheme of things, but choosing your meaning does, like choosing your purpose? Yeah, the the relation between his, Pascal's contingency and the absurd in Sartre is a is a bit loose. They're they're somewhat related, and I wanted to bring that up because the author anticipates it here. But Pascal's Pascal's insistence on the unimportant the radical contingency of view is more like don't take whatever low goals you happen to have right now too seriously because you're actually not that important. Your prob whatever you're doing right now to distract yourself is probably, even if it's not a sport, it's probably basically the same. It's probably like a guy bouncing the ball around. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I don't know, I mean, he's He's not saying that's completely wrong. He's saying, we, as I mentioned last class, that we, he's saying we do need distraction and we do need um, habit. But remember that ultimately something far grander is our calling because we're disinherited beings. And these things that we occupy ourselves with on this, in these various tasks we have to engage in now in our present state don't matter ultimately all that much. So I've got more I want to share with you about Pascal, but not on this discussion sheet. So I don't want to hand out any one right now though, so let's call the day. I'll see you, I'll call it, I'll see you on Tuesday. Yeah. So we'll, we'll finish off our Pascal unit then, and then we'll take our Kierkegaard quiz to begin that unit. So is he saying that you're calling is what matters? It's 